Welcome to the New Books Network. Hello and welcome to another episode on the New Books Network. I'm one of your hosts, Dr. Miranda Melcher, and I'm really looking forward to this conversation. And we have a very cool author with us today, Dr. Michelle McSweeney, who wrote a book titled OK. Literally, one word, very succinct title. Uh, This book is part of Bloomsbury's Object Lessons series. It's one of the newest installments in 2023. And obviously, as you might expect, the book is about the word OK, which is fascinating in its own right. Anyone just thinking about it goes, hang on a second, I use that word all the time, and yet I've probably not thought much about it. But there's actually even more to this story um, as one reads in the book. So Michelle, I'm very pleased to welcome you in the podcast to tell us all about it. Awesome. Thanks. I'm so happy to be here. Before we dive into all things okay, though, um, could you maybe introduce yourself a bit and explain why you decided to write this book? Definitely. Um, So I work in data science. I currently manage the data science content team at Brilliant. I teach data visualization at the City University of New York, Um, but my academic background is in linguistics and chemistry, so a little bit of everything. Um, and I wrote this book because about 10 years ago, I was, you know, starting on my dissertation research and I wrote my dissertation about text messaging. Um, and I was tracking all of these fascinating words like LOL, WYA, which is an acronym for where are you at for everyone who doesn't speak like that. Um, and other like really cool acronyms, um, And I was doing like all this work about like networks and the spread of words through networks, which was all very interesting. Um, But it like told this story about creativity and like human creativity, which was way more interesting to me. Um, Because, you know, I think the theme that runs through everything that I do is like, you know, humans are incredible, creative, you know, humans are incredibly creative. And seeing that come to life through all of these words led me to understanding OK and like looking at OK and looking at how words throughout history have like gone through the language like wildfire. So um, that's kind of my background and like what led me to this book. I'm really fascinated now by the combination of linguistics and chemistry, Um, but I promise I will stay focused on the book and the word OK, because it does have uh, it does really reveal that idea of creativity and things spreading really quickly and very interestingly. So we obviously have to start from kind of the origin point. Where does the word OK actually come from? Totally. So um, there's the direct answer to that. And then there's like more existential answer to that. Um, so the direct answer to that is that in 1930, or in 1839, um, one of the editors of the Boston Morning Post was making fun of the editor of the Provincetown um, Journal. And, you know, Boston was this like urbane place and Provincetown was kind of rural. And the editor um, wrote the word all correct. Okay. Right. And we all know that all correct should be AC, but he wrote it. Okay. And he was doing that to really pick on how they spoke. Um, and he was just, he was trying to call them backwards. Um, and it caught on. Right. And this was this moment in American history when like penny presses were everywhere. So like everybody was reading, it was this incredible explosion of reading and writing that was happening across the country. In tandem with that um, was also this like new market for journalists to start writing more and more people to become journalists. You know, you didn't have to have the same kind of pedigree in order to become a writer. So it was opening this up and like democratizing the space and, um, You know, OK was not the only acronym that day. There were so many acronyms in the newspaper that day because as the language was being democratized, you know, people were starting to take more ownership of it. So the existential, like philosophical reason that OK got started 
had nothing to do with this joke between the editors and had a lot more to do with the fact that people were taking ownership over language and they were playing. It was amazing. You read through papers of this time and people are asking, um, people are using OFM for our first men. Right. And it's everywhere. And like, depending on what kind of paper you're reading, it has this like second meaning and, you know, we can get into all the politics of it. Um, but it was just this moment where people were like playing with language. It was so rampant that people would go to the bar and order like WB for wine bitters. I have no idea what wine bitters is. You know, that's also been lost to the sands of time. But um, it was not only happening in newspapers, but it was also just happening in the wider culture of like really changing how people communicated. Right. In addition to that, because there were all of these newspapers and all of these penny presses coming up, you know, people were really committed to their newspaper. And this kind of created a world where you had this in-group language and this out-group language. So if you were a reader of the Boston Morning Post, you had been reading the Boston Morning Post every weekday for however long, right? So you were kind of like in the in-group. And you would know that on this day, the word okay was used as a joke for all correct. And tomorrow you would reference, you'd be able to read okay without the gloss, without the like all correct written beside it. So as people are starting to take more ownership of language, people are also developing this in-group language where like, oh, we have these like inside jokes and I know exactly what you're saying or you know exactly what I'm saying. Same way that teenagers do when they make new friends and they have inside jokes and, you know, same way you do with toddlers and you have like home language where you've like Mm -hmm. made up words like, oh, go wash your paws, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think every family probably has their own sort of adaptation to things. Um, But of course, the language that we have in our families doesn't then become a global sensation, right? Not all of these acronyms, you know, we don't still order WB and mean wine bearers. So how does OK start in this sort of thing and become something not just widespread throughout the United States, but quite literally across multiple languages. Totally. This is where it gets so cool because for whatever reason, the Democrat, okay, let me back up a little bit. So in 1840, there was a presidential election, right? So OK had been around for a few months, you know, a few little pockets of people were using it. Um, But the Democrats were putting up their candidate, Martin Van Buren. And Martin Van Buren was getting all kinds of pushback for being like way too highbrow and like not accessible to the people. So the Democratic Party comes up with this idea. They're going to give him a nickname, Old Kinderhook. There's more to that story, but the short of it is they give him this nickname, Old Kinderhook. They're kind of humanizing him, making him more accessible. And it's the first presidential election since the penny presses have come in. Right. So there's so much more media around this election than ever before. So the Democrats start saying that they're going to have meetings of the OK Club, right, the old Kinderhook Club. But they don't call it the old Kinderhook Club. They're just like, oh, it's going to be the OK Club making a play on old Kinderhook and all correct. Like we are the OK at the all correct group. Um, So they start putting it in the newspapers and it spreads across the country so that by the end of that election cycle, most Americans had heard of OK and like could see the double meaning of all correct and old Kinderhook. Um, And it was like not just limited to the newspapers. They were making pins that had OK on it. So even after the election, there's accounts of people wearing the OK pin And it meaning opposition to the Whig Party, Um, because, you know, around 1840, it was Whigs, not Republicans. But um, they lost, you know, the Democrats lost and Van Buren did not become president. Um, But those OK pins were still around for like quite a while. Um, So it was really just like good timing with this election that like pushed it across the country, Um, whereas, you know, the Democratic Party wasn't talking about wine bitters. 
shocking absolutely shocking that they could have missed that out um despite this though i thought it was really interesting how you discussed that ok was spreading really rapidly in some respects including in in this example high politics and it was in newspapers people were talking about it but it wasn't in books like on purpose why not yeah so we have this like nice calm early 1830s homeostasis situation the publishing houses have control of all print in come the penny presses in come these like cheap widely accessible newspapers and they're starting to lose control very quickly right so the penny presses are printing these serial novels the serial fiction and suddenly everybody could afford to read to read novels to read fiction to read newspapers to read everything that they couldn't afford to read you know um 10 years ago so the publishing houses are looking at this and they're like, we are losing the grip on culture. We are not going to be able to survive unless we have some sort of value add in the books that we're publishing. So the they crack down very, very hard on what language is highbrow, what language is high culture, what language is appropriate versus what language is colloquial, lowbrow and for the quote unquote common people. Um, and one of the words that really gets onto this blacklist is okay, right? It is banned from books because if they start allowing things like okay, even in its like hyper corrected okay form, then they're just continuing on with common language and they're getting swept up into whatever is happening right now as opposed to holding on to culture and saying, this thing is durable. This book is durable. This is going to stand the test of time and therefore it's worth investing in it much more than you're going to invest in these newspapers. You know, Louisa May Alcott makes like a very important appearance in this, right? Because it's not that authors didn't try. Because at this time, you know, authors are writing quote unquote dialect into books but it is very marked as being like, this is the dialect of someone who speaks a non-standard form of English. And that is very othering. But there were some authors like Henry David Thoreau, Louise May Alcott, um, that were trying to get okay into their books. Louise May Alcott like succeeded and then it still got taken out. So in the first version of Little Women, Beth, when she's talking about like getting married, says that she's going to make everything okay, okay, right? And that's interesting because okay, is a hyper correction. It's the same thing like if you want to have multiple octopus, it's octopuses, it's not octopi, but we hyper correct and sometimes we say octopi. So Louisa May Alcott was like, okay, I'm going to hyper correct this thing and I'm going to get it in there. And she did. And the first edition of Little Women has the word okay. And then the second edition does not um, because it was very clearly edited out because, again, it was seen as being just inappropriate for long-term durable culture. So that is an interesting decision on the part of the publishers and doesn't exactly put them on the right side of history or progress, um, which perhaps says concerning things about publishers today. Who knows? We shall see. Um, We're because, talking about 150 years ago. They're great today. <laughs> yeah, no, that's fair. Um, we, we, I mean, we could have a whole book now about OK, not just uh, whether or not to put it in one sentence in one book. So uh, that makes a lot of sense to kind of think about how uh, publishers were worried about the march of progress, because, of course, there were a whole bunch of other things going on that very much were in favor of OK. And um, if we're talking about the 1800s, um, we can literally hear them. Telegraphs, railroads, telephones, all the precursors to the fact that I can currently interview you with a whole uh, ocean between us, I'm assuming. So how do those things, those three things in particular, the telegraph, the railroad, and the telephone, you argue in the book that they, quote, create a perfect environment for the spread and evolution of okay? 
How? Oh, yeah. Talk about modernity, right? Like the telegraph, the railroad, and the telephone. I think about this all the time of how head spinning it must have been to live when these things were coming to fruition, right? So the railroad and the telegraph have this, you know, they were tied up very, very closely together because the railroad is changing the shape of the world. And that changing the shape of the world means that there's this immediate and like pressing need to communicate and coordinate across very long distances. Um, People needed to be able to communicate basic information and they also needed a way to confirm that they got that basic information. And OK was perfect. It's two letters. It was widely understood, widely used. Um, and, you know, telegraphs, unlike all the technology we live in today, telegraphs were billed per letter, per word, right? So, OK is so perfect because not only is it widely understood and super efficient, but it's also cheap. So you can send a short, cheap telegraph that says, okay, I know what time the train is departing. I know what time the train is coming in. I know that this train can't leave today for whatever reason. I know there's a crack in the track. So okay is like the perfect word for that. But right on the heels of the telegraph comes the telephone. And it's the same thing that like, Railroads are needing this extra communication, and they're, they were the first to adopt the telephone, right? So they're adopting this new technology. They're starting to communicate faster, and there's already this tradition is probably overstating the case, but there's already this semi-tradition of using OK to say, hey, I understood what you're saying to me. We can move forward to the next step, right? So they just import that into the telephone. But there's the side Um, process going on that OK is perfect for a static, crackly telephone line. Because the O in OK, if everyone listening at home, if you put your two fingers at the front of your throat and you say O, you can feel a vibration. And then you say K, the start of the K is completely silent. There's no vibration. So it's very different sonority, right? So it's perfect if you're talking on a super crackly line, you have this very distinct sound to be able to say, okay, okay. And so the train engineers start using okay when they're talking on a telephone to say, okay, I understood the instructions, move on to the next thing. And at that time, all of this is so modern and so shiny and so exciting that it's like everyone kind of wanted to be a little bit affiliated with the railroads or you didn't, or you wanted to completely not, but whatever it was, you know, you have this important place for the railroads and the telegraphs and the telephones. Um, So as the telephone starts coming into individual people's homes, they still need a way to say, okay, move on to the next topic that you're going to tell me about. And at that time, telephones were like not as clear as they are today at all. We are on crackly lines. So people needed this discourse marker to keep the conversation going. And OK was perfect for that. It's short, it's quick, and it says, OK, keep going. Move on to the next topic. Um, So it really starts with this like high technology of the railroads and the telegraph and the railroad engineers they pick it up in the telephone and then the telephone spreads across the country. Um, And we get all of these new functions for the word okay. It spreads across the country and also, of course, across the world, right? Okay is not just an American thing. How did it go global? Yeah, totally. Okay is the... So Coca-Cola did a study a while back about like the most widely used words and okay is known everywhere in the world, right? Um, So obviously it was born as like this American word, but um, particularly in like radio and television, and it's television that like really exported okay around the world. Um, Because you can translate a lot of American television, right? 
but you can give subtitles and that's great, but there's some words that just stand out. And they're words that are either like super um, strong sonority difference, so like, okay, or words that have like a very specific meaning that doesn't really translate well, like, okay, right? Um, So especially during the Cold War, as American culture was being like exported around the world, and there was a lot of motivation to export American culture around the world, you see English being exported and okay following along with it, you know? And it's this like, particularly then, um, you know, we're talking like 1960s-ish, it was this really lightweight and ephemeral way to signal alignment with American ideals, right? So doing something like wearing blue jeans might've been a very visual and very like durable way to signal alignment with American ideals. But using okay is much safer because you can say, okay, and you're showing that like, oh, you have this international orientation and you like know about American English and you're using it and no one can really call you out on it in the wrong context. Um, So that didn't really help it spread, but it was one side effect of okay being pushed around the world through this like pushing of American culture um, that gave it kind of this like privileged status in a lot of ways. And of course, it doesn't hurt that it's easy to say, it's short, it's sweet, you know, all the things that made it popular across America very much translate. And I really love that idea of kind of the safety of it, right? It's signaling, um, but in a less intensive way and therefore more accessible way. Um, All right. So moving on from kind of the progress of OK, it has now we've gotten to the point where it has now swept the world. Um, Everyone uses it all the time. We don't think about it. And we certainly don't think about sort of any of the impacts of kind of the internet and those technologies that we're so familiar with now, I guess, read going into the book, I wasn't that surprised to find you talk about the telegraph and the telephone. I didn't know the story, but I was kind of like, okay, you know, this makes sense, right? I was not really expecting you to talk about early email and how it impacts our use of the word um, as well. So could you help us excavate this part of shaping the word? Totally. This is where it gets so cool. So I like have a soft spot in my heart for interviews with the early, um, the people who are working on the early versions of email, right? Because they are so sure that it is going to be used in this like completely terse, like it's basically going to be used like a telegraph, but faster and more durable and you can add an attachment, right? So like, cool. Their idea was that it was going to be used to send short instructions and very clear, quick communication and that we wouldn't need any quote unquote formalities. Um, I love listening to their interviews because it's like they created this technology that has completely reshaped the world and they were completely wrong about the social side of it. And like that dichotomy is just jarring because, you know, they're thinking about it like a telegraph because that's the mental model that they had. But once email got into the hands of like, large numbers of users. And you can actually see this in the Enron corpus, which is um, a collection of emails sent between um, executives and, you know, managers at Enron before the, all the Enron collapsed. Right. Um, And they're publicly available. You can just look up the corpus and you can see, okay, being used for everything because it's cheap to send an email. It's basically free. And we use it much more socially. So you can send me something like see you at six, which, you know, I might not send a telegram back for because like it costs money, but I'll send an email. Okay. And then if we're really close and I'm like kind of being cutesy, I might say, okay. Or if I'm really being cutesy, I might say, okay, I E E. You don't see a lot of that in the Enron corpus, but you do see it in other corpora. Um, 
but it's this like moment where we just have this explosion again in communication, right? And people are like connecting in email and chat rooms and all of these places that they had never connected before, which also means that they need to perform their identity in writing. And this is, I think, the thing that defines our modern moment where we are communicating and writing all day long. You know, I use Slack and email and text message, and that's how I spend my day. And all of those are in writing and all of those I'm trying to communicate who I am through the way that I write things and the way that I spell things. And, you know, one way that we do that is play with um, words like, okay, or we play with words like good morning or good night or bye, or these words that their purpose is not necessarily to communicate information like see you at six. Their purpose is to, uh, you know, confirm receipt, check in with someone. It's called phatic communion. Um, Things that don't really carry semantic meaning, but that are important for our social relationships. And things that don't really communicate semantic meaning, but are socially important, are the perfect candidates to hang your identity on, right? And we see this moment with like email and chat rooms where people are coming together that might not have come together before, and they're creating new communities. And one way to signal that, hey, I'm a member of that new community is to spell something like, okay, or good morning in a particular way. Um, one example of this that I periodically see, and then I always ask people, I'm like, do you like, are you involved in gaming? Do you read manga? Things like this is when someone writes O-K-I-E-E-E or some number of E's, pick however many E's you want. Um, because it's such a, it's so tightly associated with people who've organized around those interests. Um, and it's really interesting watching this across the internet, like all of these different forms of okay. Thank you for um, explaining that and kind of the signaling of it. Um, I found that section of the book uh, unexpected and fascinating. And of course, the signaling piece of it that we've talked about so far in terms of, okay, keep the conversation going, or yeah, I've got it, or I'm part of this community, um, translates it as well to the physical realm, right? Okay has a gesture. Yeah. How did that happen? (laughs) That is such a good question. Honestly, like no one's really documented very well how it got a gesture. Um, The best idea is actually um, the, so all of the hand gestures where like your index finger is touching your thumb um, or your middle finger is touching your thumb, all of these are called ring gestures. And around the world, there's this gesture for precision. That is, you know, the index finger and the thumb very close together. And it's a ring gesture, this like class of gestures that have been around forever. Um, And the best idea is that okay came out of that. But no one really knows because unlike writing, gesture doesn't get doesn't get recorded as well. That's all I got. Okay, yeah. fair enough. Yeah, I can imagine that um, obviously physical gestures are probably harder to track than linguistic ones. Totally. And recently there's been, you know, okay has been used in less appropriate ways. You know, it's been used to symbol white supremacy, but it's also still used to symbolize okay, all correct. Um, and, you know, that has actually a better documentation than the history of okay or as a gesture. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, One thing that's obviously kind of been an implied theme throughout this is the relationship between OK and technology. I'd like to make that a little bit more explicit as we come to the second half of the interview, because you actually argue in the book, quote, more than any other word, OK exemplifies how technology is written into language. Can you tell us about what you mean there? Yeah, totally. So... You know, language changes as culture changes, as technology changes, 
you know, we could get deconstructivist and talk about the boundary between technology and culture, but like as human communities change, language changes. That's just a fact. But okay is amazing, right? Because it is purely a written word. Most of our words were not born written. Most of our words were born spoken and then they got written down. So that's the first way that like, okay, doesn't actually even exist without technology because writing is our original community, actually probably not original, but it's one of the earliest communication technologies humans have invented, right? So like, okay, couldn't even exist without this technology existing. And then at all of these junctures, it's gotten a new spelling, it's gotten a new purpose, it's gotten a new identity because it was at the right place in the right time and had this purpose that never existed before. So if we think about like the railroads and the telegraphs, you never needed to communicate that much information across long distances um, before the railroads and the telegraphs. And that's when OK comes in. And it's really the moment where it loses its dots, right? Like it loses the periods because there's so many OKs being sent and you don't want to pay to send a dot. That's silly. So you're just going to send an O and a K, no dots. Um, we see OKAY as this hypercorrection trying to squeeze it into uh, pub to published books, um, which is, again, this like moment where the penny presses are putting this pressure on the language and the language is adapting in the same way. Same thing with the email and, you know, the chat rooms more generally is that it's putting this pressure on the language and we get K, 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 O, K, I, E, E, all of those forms um, because there's this communication pressure or this communication opportunity um, that is reshaping it and giving it these whole new lives and new identities. And there's other words that have changed and evolved recently, but it's less obvious, right? So like intensify or so. If I want to say, oh my gosh, it's so hot outside, right? That kind of so hot or I'm so enjoying this movie. That kind of so enjoying, that's a relatively new construction. You know, the so, how are you doing today? That one's a little bit older. We could tie that back to language change, but it's just not as clear of a story as what OK does because it's picking up all of these new spellings and new um, new functions. So to then take that further, um, you talk about OK in terms of an alliance between our humanity and technology. What do you think OK kind of teaches us about that relationship? Totally. So the thing that I think is really most beautiful about OK is that, you know, it has all these like moments in history and I can put down these signposts and say in this year and in that year, these technologies were invented. But the only reason that it caught on is because everyone who uses it found it useful. And we have these moments where our technology changes and our opportunities for communication change in response. But it's like ultimately baked into us as humans to be so creative. And it's baked into us as humans to want to connect with each other. And OK didn't like gain momentum because it was this top down thing. It gained momentum the way all other words gain momentum, that people used it between each other and they were creative together and they created something new together. Um, and you can make the same argument about technology being people coming together and making something new, but you can also make the argument about our language that people communicate and they come up with something new and novel and textured for them in that moment. That's a very nice thought wonderful for ending ending the main um, interview with it, which leaves me with only one final question. Uh, the book is out uh, pretty 
pretty much just out really um so people can read it which sort of leads me to ask is there anything you might be working on now or next whether or not it's a book whether or not it's about okay uh, that you'd like our listeners to be aware of yeah so i'm actually working on two other books um one is with the publisher it's you know in in its process um and that one's about the word data which explores the origins of data with Euclid, you know, 600 BC Euclid, um, where it really means assumptions, right? And through, it's like the starting place for an argument and then traces it through these various points of history, the advent of computers to this like modern data-driven culture where data and facts have become almost synonymous, even though they really shouldn't be. Um, and walks us through, like, from its origins, the points where it me- its meaning kept shaping and shifting um, to get us to this moment today. Um, the other book that I'm working on is totally, like, rooted in linguistics. It's a children's book about a young bird who is learning his song. Um, and bird song acquisition is very interesting. It's not you know, it's not exactly like human language acquisition. It is not human language acquisition. Um, but bird families are very similar to human families um, with the amount of like attention and investment that they put into their young. Um, so just literally for play, I'm working on this children's book about learning a bird song. <laughs> Well, those both sound like very fun projects. Um, Best of luck with them both. Um, And while you are off telling people about data and bird songs, uh, listeners can read the book we've been discussing, which I'm pretty sure at this point people will remember the title. But just in case, it's titled OK. And it was published by Bloomsbury. Michelle, thank you so much for being with us on the podcast. Thank you so much. It's truly been a pleasure.